<laughs> so it's like there's no need. How was your weekend? Those of you who weren't here yesterday, you got your flight. I noticed that you were in 370 actually. No, you weren't. No, it's the other area. That's right. So you got home okay. Good. Good. <laughs> All right, so what would you, get, would you guys have done in this situation? We'll come back to, to talking about things like this later on. Um, so I'm in Detroit, in the airport on Saturday. And uh, the Tr Detroit airport is actually pretty cool. Has anybody been there? That, like, tunnel between the terminals? It's pretty awesome, huh? Um, so anyhow, I had this five-hour layover in Detroit because they had oversold my first flight and bumped me to the next flight. And then they had oversold the next flight from Detroit to Salt Lake as well. And so as we were all getting on, they kept saying, we need a couple of people to volunteer to stay in Detroit overnight. We'll put you on the first flight in the morning, and we will pay for your hotel, and we'll give you $400 in travel vouchers. And I thought, oh, my kids will be mad if I don't show up tonight, but $400. So what would you have done? Would you have taken the money yes. and stayed? Yes? No, I can't hear this <laughs> so I'm asking the wrong crowd. Let's see, poor college students. Yes, take them. <laughs> Good, that's the right choice. So Because it was essentially, I paid $400 to get home earlier, right? Because I gave up that money. That could have been money in my pocket, but I gave it up in order to be home, you know, probably 12 hours earlier than I, than I would have been. And it's not like my kids, well, they were up when I got home. It was really late, but they were still up. So we'll talk actually about this later on. So this was, that would have been the rational decision, right? So it, uh, maximizing my gains. Um, but people are really, really irrational. We don't do that very often. So we'll do things like give up $400 in order to be home you know, 12 hours earlier when I could have missed church as well the next day. That would have been fun with me as well. No, we had a ward conference. So it was all right. And my... My stake president told a baseball story. I love it when church leaders tell baseball stories. I don't know why. I just think that's the best thing ever. And he told a Little League baseball story. I thought that was fantastic. All right. So yesterday we talked about forgetting and the, the uh, what's that thing called where you forget things? The forgetting curve. Who came up with the forgetting curve? Ebbinghaus, yeah. So way back in like 1885, right? Ebbinghaus comes up with the forgetting curve, and we're still using Ebbinghaus's um, research and, and talking about Ebbinghaus over 100 years later. So today, <coughs> we're also going to talk about some, some historical stuff, but we'll also talk about some new stuff that's pretty cool. Um, Loftus's stuff is sort of medium um, historical. So she did some classical studies. She's still around, Elizabeth Loftus is. Um, still doing research, still talking at conferences and things like that. She actually spoke at a conference in Salt Lake last year, which I was at. Um, Bartlett is old-timey, um, and we'll talk a little bit about Bartlett's studies. And then the DRM stuff is all new and used currently in fMRI kinds of studies. All right, so your memory is not as good as you think it is. So um, we talked yesterday about forgetting and how we rapidly forget things. And so everybody sort of agrees with that, that, that that's your experience, right? You don't remember what you had for dinner last Thursday night, but you do remember um, what you had for dinner last night, for example. So you, re you forget things pretty rapidly at first, and then it sort of shallows out. So we know that we forget stuff, but of the stuff that we remember, we feel like that's the real thing that happened, right? We feel like we have accurate memories for the stuff that we don't forget. Um, I'm here to tell you today that that's not the case. Your memory is crap. Um, because your memory is not... Well, let's take a step back. What's the point of memory? Why do we have memories? Okay? If we didn't, we, um, we didn't there would be no learning. <clears throat> okay, but... What, why do we need to learn? Um, Sunday school we answers. Uh, well, yeah, you could come up with the Sunday school answers. <laughs> so we can reproduce better. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a, what's the point of any behavior, right? So that we can get women, right? <laughs> well, no, seriously, that's what your genes want to do. They want to propagate themselves in the, into the next generation. And so the best way to do that, well, is to not die. So um, if you can remember life-threatening situations, or if you can remember where the food is, or if you can remember where the women are, things like that, or you know what makes women mad and not want to, to breed with you, then these things are all good things to remember, right? So, so that's the, sort of the point of learning, is to propagate your spe your, the species, right? To propagate your genes into the next generation. All right, so is it any good in those situations to remember exactly what happened on, I don't know, December 3rd, 1993? Is that going to increase your probability for your mating probability. Is it an anniversary or birthday? Ah, this is a good question. Um, no, it's just a normal day of the week. Let's say it was a Thursday. I have no idea if it actually was Thursday, but let's pretend. Depending on what happened that day, it might be useful for you. Okay, a how so? Significant event happened or um, <clears throat> something that would matter in someone's life. Let's say that's a day that mortgages <laughs> something that's just important you need to recall. What if it was just a generic day? Maybe, maybe not so much, right? But if that's the day that you knew the person, then you need to remember what happened and what happened to your mate in general. Okay. So it gives you more context in your relationship. Okay. So for relationship purposes, maybe? Court? Yeah, I was just going to say, what about memories that, that, and I would think this is true for most people, that most memories are not tied to dates or times, but we have like general memories. Uh, say, if you were to say what kinds of things were happening in my life December of last year, I can tell you, but if you said what happened December 15th last year, I probably wouldn't. Okay, so you've got more of a gist memory, sort of an acontextual, I remember these things happening, but not specifically what day they happened. Okay. I want to come back to sort of what Elizabeth was talking about. So if it's, a, if it's an anniversary or a birthday or something like that, why is it important to remember my anniversary, for example? Benefits of Benefits my survival, okay. <laughs> my mother's birthday is coming up later in the month. Is, it, is that beneficial for me to remember? Yeah. At what time is that beneficial for me to remember? Now or sometime in the future? Well, now so that I can prepare, I can go out and get her a gift or something. But it's, <clears throat> it's for future behavior, right? So the whole point of memory is to influence what we do in the future. Like remembering my sixth birthday doesn't actually buy me anything. Remembering how great it was for me to get a bike sort of influences my future behavior and maybe buying my kids bikes and things like that. But the whole point of having memory is to influence our future behavior. So having a veridical memory, does anybody know what veridical means? I use this term a lot. Truthful, truthful yeah. So having an accurate, truthful, um, true-to-life representation is exceptionally useless. There's no real reason to have, you know, this perfect recall of what happened on December 3rd, 1993, it's much better to have sort of this general representation like Corey was talking about. Last December, I generally did this sort of stuff so that next December, I sort of know what to expect, right? Last season, I remember that the food was here. Next season, I know where to go. Does this make sense? So the whole point of memory is to influence our future behavior. So having a true memory of the past really doesn't help us that much. Having a, tr a memory of the past that helps us to predict the future, now that's useful. So we modify our memories. Memory is usually a reconstruction. So let me, show you, let me give you some evidence for how we reconstruct our memories. The reconstruction depends on how you cue the memory. So these are, are studies done by Elizabeth Loftus. So um, this, in these um, studies, subjects, students usually, view videos, view movies of a car accident. And then they're asked questions about the car accident. Um, so one version of the question is, how fast were the cars going when they contacted, or sorry, when they smashed into each other, versus how fast were the cars going when they contacted each other? Now, if I asked you these two questions, would it change your answer, depending on how I asked you? How would it change your answer? Smashes at a super fast. You just feel like they're going fast. 
Right, exactly. Um, and that's exactly the data that they, that they see, is that when they're asked the smashed question, the answers average about 40 miles an hour. When they're asked the contacted question, answers average about 30 miles an hour. And then, so I sort of set the scene by saying, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into one another? And then if I ask you subsequent questions, <clears throat> like was there broken glass on the ground? If I had previously asked you the smashed question, you're more likely to say, oh yeah, I remember there was broken glass on the ground. So just by how I ask you the question, I change your memory. Your memory is modified that you think, oh, they were going faster than they actually were. There was broken glass. There's more, more of a bigger accident. Is this related to schemas? Yes, it is related to schemas. And, and we'll get to schemas in just a minute. So schemas um, are sort of our, our scripts for things, right? So things that, that we sort of expect from the world. <coughs> so big time car accidents, you know, big, tragic, fast moving car accidents, we've got a schema for that, right? Getting backed into in the parking lot, we've got a schema for that as well. It's not usually broken glass. There's, you know, is the damage is fairly minor, things like that. Um, and so we sort of fit things in in, con in the context of our schema. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> um, another version of this experiment was, let me see if I remember how they did this. <coughs> oh, you can, you can implant false memories is, is the point of this. So if you show people this, no, yeah, this sl series of slides, there's multiple versions of this, and I can't keep them straight. I don't have a veridical memory for this, and I just told you that veridical memories are useless, so that's okay. All right, so you show them this series of events, for example, and then you ask them questions about how fast was the car going when it, went, when it rolled through the yield sign, for example. So you can have people, depending on your questions, you can have people remember details that weren't actually there. Um, this is sort of the, the point of the misinformation paradigm. So this was done actually by one of my, um, one of my um, lab mates in grad school, um, Yoko Okado. What she did is she went around and she took a bunch of photos of these little vignettes, these little stories. So in this story, um, this, you can't really see her in this picture. This woman's walking along, she bumps into a friend, her friend asks her um, about what she's been doing. She says she's been shopping. She pulls out the DVD that she got either, and I can't tell what this is. I think it's Aladdin versus the X-Files, something like that. And then this other, I think this is the same guy that um, picks her pocket and puts her wallet either in his coat pocket or in his back pocket. And then they go on. So this is a critical item here, where the first time you see it, you see this vignette. And then we say, OK, we're going to show you the same story again. Um, we'd like you to just watch these, these things. So you show her the same thing. Some of these things are different, like the video is different, or where he's putting the, the, the wallet. And then other things are exactly the same. So some of the things are consistent across the two stories. Some of the things are different. And then we say, we want you to remember, so we changed some of the things in the second video. We want you to remember what happened in the first video. Um, and depending on how you ask the question, you can have people remember things from the second video that were not actually present in the first video. So you can have people, if you ask people leading questions, they'll remember things that never actually happened. This is incredibly easy to do with kids. So um, there's this great study by a guy named C.C. Ah. Where they told a group of kindergartners, Mr. Brown is coming to visit our class tomorrow, and he is very clumsy. So just so you know, just so you're aware, that there's going to be a man sitting in the back of the class. He's, um, he'll, he'll be here for a little while, but he's very clumsy. And so the next day, Mr. Brown comes in, sits in the back of the class, doesn't touch anything, doesn't talk to anybody, sits there for about 20 minutes, then gets up and leaves. And then a week or so later, they come in and they ask the kids, do you remember when Mr. Brown came to visit our class? Oh, yeah. Do you remember how clumsy he was? Oh, yeah, he was so clumsy. He knocked over the bookshelf. He fell down. He tripped on his way in. And they come up with all these details about how clumsy Mr. Brown was. Did he do any of this stuff? Nope. 
Do the kids remember him doing this stuff? Yep. Um, and they'll come up with these great confabulated stories of how clumsy Mr. Brown was. And you can go with it. You can reinforce it. And the kids will, will swear that all of this stuff happened. Danny? Um, I remember when I was a kid, I'd you know, make up stuff. Like someone said, hey, did you go to see the Ninja Turtles? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw it. How did they control for it just being like social lying versus they actually believe that that's what happened? Um, I don't know that you can necessarily. I mean, the kids may go along and, and you know, try and please the, the questioner and, and just go along with whatever the questioner asks. Um, and then if you say, now, that, did that really happen? Now, tell the truth. What do, you, what do you really remember happening? I mean, that's the best that you can really do in those circumstances. You can't tell the kid, no, you're lying. This never happened. Because the kid's gonna, just going to double down and say, yes, no, I, I really did see it. So, I mean, that's, that's a problem. This particularly becomes a problem in cases of uh, purported abuse, right? So kids remember abuse happening that may or may not have actually happened. Um, and so you really want them to tell the truth, and even in those circumstances, you can demonstrate, you can prove that the abuse didn't happen, but the kid will still remember it happening. Now, this is not just in kids that this happens. So in college students, you can, you can have college students come in, and you can say, do you remember that time when, you, when your parents lost you at the mall? And you check with the, with the, with the participants' parents beforehand to make sure that, they, that that actually never happened. So you're relying on, your parent, on their parents' memories for, for the kid's childhood. And as a parent, you would remember if you'd lost your kid at the mall, probably. It's a traumatic enough event that it would probably stand out for the parents as well. So you bring the kid, or you, not the kids, the college students into the lab. You say, do you remember that time when you were lost at the mall? No. No, really, we talked to your parents. They told us about it. That, and you give them details. And, and it turns out that the more details you give, the more believable it is. And you can have people endorse these memories that you just made up. You just implanted in them. You say, they start to say, well, that does sound kind of familiar. I remember going to the mall with my, my parents. I remember being upset about being at the mall and being left there. Oh, how dare my parents do that to me? <laughs> And you can have people endorse these memories that are, that are not true. You can, you can implant these things. You can implant pretty tragic and pretty traumatic memories in, in, um, in adults as well, especially if you're a therapist and especially if you're really digging for them. So this whole idea of repressed memories, of um, abuse during childhood that just comes out during therapy later on in life, not real memories, it turns out. So if you look at the incidents of... The reporting of, I hate this marker. Let's see if this one's any better. Ah, much better. When was this? This was about 1990, maybe. So if you look at the incidence of the number of cases of, of um, repressed memory, so these are you go into therapy as an adult. And with the therapist, you uncover these memories of abuse that had happened during your childhood. And then you go confront your abuser, and they say, no, that never happened. And a lot of people thought that it was because the abuser was just denying it, and they were just trying to cover up. But if you look at the number of cases, there was a steady rise in these things during the 80s and early 90s. And about the mid-90s or so, it really peaked. And then it went out of vogue. So why would they go away? Why would the number of... of abuse cases go away. It's not like, you know, in 1970, there was a peak in the number of cases of child abuse. What would explain that pattern of, of data? I think it was simultaneous with the time that uh, psychologists started doing hypnotism for recalling memory. Yeah, and so as this sort of technique, this so-called therapy technique, went out of vogue, the number of cases went away. So it was completely induced by the therapist. There were, there were no such things as, as repressed memories. Sarah? Didn't that happen with Freud as well? The Freud uncovered these things? Yeah, yeah so the whole idea of repression, yeah, the whole idea of repression starts out with Freud um, and then really comes into vogue with some researchers in Baltimore, well, not researchers, some therapists in Baltimore who were sort of using Freud's methods of hypnosis and, and things like that to, to uncover these memories. 
that really weren't there. And there were some famous cases of this. So like Roseanne Barr, for example, recovered some, some repressed memories. All right, but that was all induced, that was all misinformation, right? That was all the false memories implanted by the, by the therapist who asks these leading questions. Tell me, about, tell me about the abuse. Tell me about the time when you were a kid when you were abused. Oh, that didn't happen. Oh, no, tell me about that. You're just repressing it, right? All right, so originally research on this starts off with um, Sir Frederick Bartlett, who has this great quote that I've sort of been paraphrasing so far, where he says, the first notion to get rid of is that memory is primarily or literally reduplicative or reproductive. In a world of constantly changing environment, literal recall is extraordinarily unimportant. So being able to remember exactly what you had for dinner last Thursday night is really unimportant. Being able to remember sort of what you had for dinner last Thursday night is really, imp is really important, it's really useful, because it'll predict what you're going to have for dinner next Thursday night. Last Thursday, I had this, this uh, it was smoked beef sandwich. It was so good. It was delicious. And poutine. I had poutine for the first time. So I remember this because I was in Canada, and I've never been to Canada before, and we went to this restaurant and things like that. So it made it sort of special, right? It makes it stand out. <clears throat> All right, so Bartlett, in order to come with, up with these conclusions, does the following experiment, which is actually pretty genius. So this was early 20th century, uh, maybe 1920s, 1930s, um, in England. So he gives English school kids vignettes like this, so sort of ghost stories from Inuits and, and different cultures, basically. So things that don't make a whole lot of sense to English school kids in the 1920s. One night, two young men from Egulac went down to the river to hunt seals, and while they were there, it became foggy and calm. Then they heard war cries, and they thought, maybe this is a war party. They escaped to the shore and hid in a log. Now canoes came up, and they heard the noise of paddles, and they saw one canoe coming up to them, etc., etc. And then it goes on to talk about ghosts, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. There's not a, really a linear story to the whole thing. So he gives them these vignettes, and then later on, he asks them to, to just retell the stories. And so what he finds is that these kids will substitute words that they don't know with words that they do know. So they understand that the canoe is a kind of boat, and so they'll say boat instead of canoe, for example. So they'll remember them being in boats instead of being in canoes. Um, they add details to put logical connections between things. So where there was a big jump in the story between two places, they sort of fill that in with things that, that will help make it logical help it make logical sense. They omit other details that are not consistent with this logical story that they've come up, come up with. They change unfamiliar terms to ones that they know better. So all of this sounds a lot like what Sarah mentioned earlier with, with schemas. And actually, Bartlett was the first person to, promote, to propose schemas. So he actually came up with, with the word. And he was never really thrilled with the word schemas, but he couldn't come up with anything better. So the idea is that we have sort of a, a script for how things go. And we fit things into the script, and as long as they're consistent with our script, then we'll remember those things. And we may have false memories for things that are consistent with our script. So your visit to the doctor's office. It may not have occurred that whoever took you back to the examination room told you the doctor will be with you shortly, but you're probably going to remember that because that's your schema for, for a doctor's visit you may have a false memory for things that didn't actually happen due to the way that we, we organize schemas. All right, so after hearing all of this, how impervious do you think you are to false memories now that you're educated? Knowing is half the battle? Yes? No? All right, let's give it a shot. You've sort of been primed, so this may not work. All right, so what I'm going to do is I am going to read you a list of words. And I apparently don't have the list in my notes, so I'm going to blank this. There we go. All right, so the list of words has 15 words on it. Um, so I'm going to read you the list. Don't write down anything. Um, and I'm going to have a little bit of a delay, and then I'm going to let you write down the, the words on the list. I've got three lists total. So here's list number one. Blanket. Tired. Yawn. 
slumber, wake, rest, dream, peace, snooze, bed, awake, doze, snore, nap, drowsy, Three, two, one. Go ahead and write down the words on the list. All right, here comes list number two. Summit, steep, goat, plain, molehill, valley, top, range, peak, hill, climb, Glacier, bike, climber, ski, four, three, two, one, go. <coughs> All right, next list. Banana, kiwi, bowl, cherry, ripe, vegetable, citrus, salad, pear, apple, orange, berry, basket, Juice, cocktail, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, go ahead and write down the words on list three. Here are the three lists. How many of you got blanket? Just a review. Why did everybody get blanket? <clears throat> it's, the first one. it's the first one. What's that called? Primacy effect. Good. All right. Uh, tired. How many got tired? Yawn. Snooze. Oh, wait. That's loaded. Slumber. Wake. Rest. Dream. Peace. Snooze. 
Um, how many got snore, nap, drowsy, portion goes up at the end. What's that called? Recency, Recency effect. Good. How many of you got sleep? Only one per a couple of people. All right. How confident are you that, when you wrote it down, how confident were you that sleep was on the list? Well, I mean, when I made the second list, I was like, wait a minute, he's trying to get me to say mountain is in here. And so I looked back <laughs> and I can't sleep. So, yeah, Curses. You saw through it. So, yeah, so the first list has to do with sleep, second list has to do with mountain, third list has to do with fruit. About a third of the time, you can get people to remember sleep being on this list, even though sleep was not on this list. So when I first did it, I was sure, confident that sleep was on the list. I, was, I would have, you know, been willing to bet money, not a lot of money, but a little bit of money. I was a poor college student then, too. So, sleep. Why do we, what about this list makes us remember sleep being on the list? Right, it all has to do with sleep. This all has to do with mountains. This all has to do with fruit. So as you're hearing each of these things, you're thinking, okay, these are all organized around a central concept of sleep. So therefore, as you're remembering each of these things, it's easy to remember sleep being on the list. So this is known as the DRM effect. So it's named after the, the researchers who came up with it. So Dees was the first one who came up with it, and then Rodiger and McDermott really sort of took it to a new level and revived it um, in the 90s. So Dees, Rodiger, and McDermott. Or the, so it's the DRM effect, and it's the DRM paradigm, where you have these, these related lists with a critically omitted lure word. So the subjects reliably recall the lures with high confidence. So it's not like, well, I kind of think sleep is on the list. It's, no, sleep is definitely on the list. <clears throat> so for some amount of you, I've induced a false memory, right? So you remember sleep being on the list even though sleep was not on the list. So if you want to, rem if you want to study false memories, this is a nice controlled way of doing it in the laboratory and in the MRI scanner, for example. So if you want to see... What does it look like when people remember, have false memories? You can do the DRM paradigm and say when they recognize sleep as being on the list, what does that activity look like versus when they see snooze and recognize that as being on the list? And guess what the brain activity looks like? Guess what differences there are between false memories and true memories? None. You're right. Yeah. So it looks exactly the same. So part of what we think is going on here is that you've got these semantic networks. So networks of activity um, in your semantic representation. I want to say in your brain, but we don't know how this is instantiated in, in your brain. So this is sort of a, an abstract construct right now. The idea is that everything is sort of related to this central idea of bird, for example. So if I activate this node, and this node, and this node, pretty soon the activity is going to spread to other nodes. Makes it easier to think about other birds, easier to recall other birds and the details of birds and things like that. So you activate the whole semantic network, and you activate this central bird representation as well. So we'll talk a little bit more on semantics today. We've still got a lot of time. Um, and definitely um, by, by Friday, by the end of the week. All right, but let me give you a summary so far. So memory is a reconstructive event. So memory is really good for predicting the future. So let's say I put you in the MRI scanner, and I have you do two tasks, one of which is I'm showing you pictures of stuff that you've done before. So I, I, I don't know, Facebook stalk you, get all of your pictures off of Facebook and then show you those pictures in the scanner. So you're going to recognize those things, right? So you're going to have memory um, centers lighting up for that. And then I take somebody else, whom you don't know, but has similar pictures to yours. And I show you those pictures, and I say, imagine yourself in this situation. So you're doing a remember task for your stuff, where I say, I show you the picture, and I say, remember this event, think about this event. And then I show you somebody else's pictures, and I say, imagine this event. So remembering versus imagining. 
Guess how much difference there is between the brain activity for remembering and imagining. Not very much. Yeah, not very much at all. Um, our data, so we actually did this task. So this was actually an undergraduate senior thesis or her capstone research project. It's kind of a cool task. So she came up with all of this stuff. She didn't Facebook stalk people. She asked people to send her their photos. <laughs> but that's exactly what she did. And what we find is that in the hippocampus, in this brain region that's responsible for memory, we get loads of activity for both remembering and imagining. Um, the activity goes in different directions. It's, it's slightly different from one another, but the same brain regions are involved. If you have damage to the hippocampus, guess how good you are at imagining future events? You're pretty cruddy at it, actually. Partly because you can't remember, you can't draw on these past events to generate future events. I mean, that's the purpose of having memory, is to imagine the future. Um, but also because this brain region seems to be involved in generating this, these imaginings. As far as like implanting memories or having involved, they're talking about when they show someone a picture and they say that this th these things happen and they replaced like something in the picture so you can back. What is that like? How do we balance that with them actually thinking that's a memory versus trusting the person or like trusting the fact that a future should be correct? You know what I mean? Oh right. Um, so like sort of the social aspects of the whole thing. Yeah, like I trust you to say that, or pictures usually are correct. This is taken with the camera, so it must be. Right. So I must remember it since it's a camera. I don't know. You can actually tell people to that you've changed things. So you can say, yes, these pictures look similar, but we've, we've changed things slightly. And it turns out that doesn't help people. So I participated in one of Yoko's experiments. I knew explicitly what she was doing. I still have false memories for the number of bananas in the, in the scene. So one of her vignettes was a girl going to the grocery store and, and picking up Yoko says she picked up three bananas. I remember there being five bananas. So I knew explicitly going in what was going on, but I still have a false memory for, for that event. So it doesn't necessarily help. I was completely skeptical of Yoko because I knew that she was going to lie to me, but didn't help. Didn't help my memory at all. Yeah, so that, that, that is something that sort of factors into it, of course, that you trust people, you, well, you know, why would my wife lie to me? Why would she tell me that you know things were different than they actually were? Wow. Who knows? Uh, maybe she remembers things differently as well. So anybody who has any shared recollections with you know family members, for example. So um, in my wife's family, her brother is the funny one, right? He's the one always telling jokes and stuff like that. But she remembers distinctly. There's one joke that she told, got the whole family laughing. And she remembers that it was her that told the joke. But if we go to a family reunion this year, this summer, and we ask anybody present there who told that joke, guess what they all remember? It was the funny one, right? It was the brother who told the joke and not her. She gets really upset about this. <laughs> that, I'm funny too, but you know, he gets all the credit because what's the schema? Christian's the funny one, yeah. Danny? Um, I, uh, a bit related to this as well, uh, also related to imagination, I was just kind of thinking about it when I was uh, you know, playing with my kids. Uh, there are all these toys, all these games, etc., that are, are meant for developing their imagination. How important is imagination really just as you mentioned? Do you have a comment well, on that? I was actually thinking about this as well, thinking back to like when I was a kid, I remember, actually remember this one time where we were supposed to be writing a story in class, and I remember pretty much writing the story that we had read the day before in class, just changing a couple things. But I think it's kind of like useful, because like you, as you're playing with like your stuffed animals, whatever, you're acting out scenes that you remember from a movie or from life, and so it kind of gives you practice almost mm -hmm. in social context or Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that evolutionary biology, and so it talks about just from an evolutionary standpoint, like a, like a long distance running hunting, like in, back in the day, <laughs> and uh, how, how it might be that we developed reasoning and analytical ability to track prey and to imagine where they would go in certain situations when we were children. 
So it's got evolutionary advantages. <clears throat> in a more immediate time scale, um, shoot, I don't remember the data on this. I went to a talk once where the, the, the presenter was a developmental psychologist talking about what is the best kind of play for later outcomes, later cognitive outcomes and, and cognitive development. And pretend play, it turned out, was hugely beneficial. The kids who do pretend play, like dress-ups or play house or play school or whatever, that that is the most beneficial kind of play. So this imaginative kind of play is, is most beneficial for all sorts of later cognitive outcomes. So for developing working memory capacity. Because what are you doing while you're, while you're playing school, while you're you know, doing this pretend play? Well, I have to remember, I have to exercise my working memory in that case, right? I have to remember what role I'm playing. I have to remember what role you're playing, things like that. So this, all this imagining and keeping things in mind actually really benefits them um, later on down the road. So it's hugely important, it turns out. So when kids get the box, that the toys come in and play with the box and pretend that it's, you know, whatever... It's actually really good, and you should encourage that sort of stuff. See? I don't know if this ties in at all, but I was in uh, one of my other psychology classes. We talked exactly about this, and there was actually a school where the play wasn't guided. There wasn't any rules or anything to see, like, how kids would, you know, what, what they would do, just kind of left to themselves. And it was really funny, because the boys would play games like tag, which are related to, like, you know, caveman hunting, and then the girls would play games with like taking care of babies and things like that so it's all about like evolutionary survival it's exactly that and you cannot you can't get kids not to do that sort of stuff I mean we explicitly don't have toy guns in our house but my little boy when he was little turned everything into a gun everything was a, a pew pew and everything sort of works out like that and my daughter who's 18 months old right now treats everything like a, like a baby doll. I mean, it's really amazing. At the same age, my son would have been running around shooting things, but she's, you know, running around cuddling them and holding them like that. It's really cute. Not so cute with the little boy hitting your things. <laughs> all right, did we go through all of this stuff? Um, so memory is a reconstructive event. We use memory for imagining the future, and that's really the point of memory, is to helping you in, in later situations. So if you remember, oh, that food is bad, that food, that's, this particular berry is poisonous, things like that, that's going to help your future behavior. You incorporate new information into memory representations. So we take these old memories and we modify them through time um, as we're retrieving them to incorporate the new information. Because things do change in the environment, and we want to be able to predict things as they're changing. Um, you organize your memories according to schemas. Um, that was the Bartlett studies. And then new information is likened to old information. So the new information that is coming in, you sort of fit into these semantic networks. So let's talk about these semantic networks. And the question is, how is semantic memory organized? How do we actually... So I threw up sort of a schema up here about birds just a minute ago. How... Is that actually how semantic memory is organized? Is that the most efficient way for us to organize semantic memory? So one way that we could organize semantic memory is to take everything you know and just throw it into a room. Um, just sort of throw it all into the filing cabinet, and it's in there somewhere, right? But how efficient is this? Say you need to know, what's the name of the actor who played the bad guy in the, um, in the episode of the Brady Bunch where they go to the Grand Canyon? Have you guys seen this episode? <laughs> how many of you have seen the Brady Bunch? All right, so everybody's seen The Brady Bunch. It's a two-part episode where they go to the Grand Canyon. They get locked in a jail by the old prospector in the ghost town. Am I out on a limb here? <laughs> Anybody seen this one? All right, Rachel's seen this at least. It's on the Tiki one. Okay, yeah, the Tiki yeah, one. Tiki one. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 where they go to Hawaii? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so... What I want to know, though, so there's this other episode where they go to the Grand Canyon, and they go to a, a, a ghost town, and they're, they're messing around in the jail, and they get locked in the jail, and there's this old prospector guy who had locked them into the jail. What's the name of the guy who, who played that prospector guy? He also played Mr. Magoo. He's done a lot of character acting work. He passed away a few years ago. Does anybody know this guy's name? 
No, <laughs> that would be awesome, but no. <laughs> okay, his name is Jim Backus. And for some reason, I remember this. It's just a complete random fact. Okay, so I'm trying to probe your memory. I'm trying to get at this sort of semantic memory. What's this guy's name? What's that one actor's name? Uh, maybe a more contemporary example. <laughs> Let's see. What's a movie that I've seen recently with that one guy? Actually, let's go with something um, a little bit less obscure. So who plays the lead in Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick. Okay. So same sort of question, right? Who played this character in, 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 um, in this movie? But you guys can pull that out without hesitation, right? Everybody knows the, the answer, Matthew Broderick. So how do you do that? If your memory is organized like this, are you going to be that quick on the draw? Are you going to be that efficient? No. You're going to be searching through this stuff. I actually found this picture because I thought it was a great picture of just a mess. And I showed it in class a couple of times, and it was like two or three semesters before I realized there's actually a person in this picture. There's this guy back here. So this is an incredibly bad way to organize things. Um, I've had professors and colleagues who have offices that look like this. I have no idea how they find anything in there. That's Similar. I, I used to work in the HVAC rooms and I had this as a piano team. And there was one professor's office I went to with, like about five times and they told me to tune both pianos and there was only ever one in there. And not, <laughs> not only was there a piano, but there was also a couch and a whole computer desk that I didn't see. Like that. Yep. <laughs> My undergrad advisor, love him to death, but his office looks exactly like He's actually got two computers in there, but looks exactly like that. All right, so the problem is, you've got an incredible amount of stuff in your memory. You know all sorts of wonderful things. How do you get at that? How do you get at uh, Matthew Broderick, is the guy who played Ferris Bueller? How do you index that information? Well, one way to do it is, is via an index. One way to do it would be like the Dewey Decimal System, right? So Matthew Broderick is going to be filed under B's, or maybe F for Ferris, or maybe M for movies. Well, it's going to be in there somewhere, and there's going to have a logical system that, that works for you, right? So if you need a book, you go to the card catalog, or you go to, and it's not a card catalog anymore, it's the, the online catalog. And actually, the, the, the Harold B. Lee Library has this great mobile phone site, where if you go on your iPhone, it'll look it up for you, tell you where it is. It's fantastic. It'd be better if it had GPS so that it could guide you directly <laughs> to where it is. But at any rate, it'll tell you where things are in the library. Is this how we organize our semantic memory? Corey, you're shaking your head. How come? Because what I thought of was when you can remember how things are connected to other things. So like you say, you know, Who's the guy who's the lead in Ferris Bueller's Day Off? I'm like, well, it's the guy who's the lead in Lady Hawk, and he's in this, and he's in that. And immediately, I start thinking of references, and so that leads me to believe that it's probably not an index. Okay. Yes. Thank you for mentioning Lady Hawk, by the way. <laughs> so boring. So boring. That's one of the best movies ever. <laughs> Cheesiest mu music. Oh, it was wonderful. Um, I went and watched it again recently, and it was, it was much better than I remember it, in spite of the cheesy music. All right, so we'll pick up here. So we'll pick up with the, the problem. So I'll leave you thinking about the problem. How is our semantic memory organized? It's obviously not an addressing system. It's not like your computer hard drive or like the library. What is it like? So we'll pick up with that next time. Quiz on Friday over what chapter is it? Six, is that right? Six, sounds good. Uh, so the lecture this week and, and the reading from chapter six.